Hi, Ross and Kathy Callaghan here again, and we're off on another cruise. This time we're going on the Pacific Aria out of Brisbane. Yes, and this is a P&O cruise, and we're heading up to Papua New Guinea, which is a new place for us, so there'll be different experiences for us to have and exciting things to see. Sounds good to me. The Aria used to be uh, Holland America Rindam, but now it's been refurbished as a P&O ship takes about 1265 passengers. So we say farewell to Brisbane, head off out from the Brisbane River. Yep, next stop, Alatau, Papua New Guinea. So the cruise officially starts as soon as we go on the other side of that bridge. We're going underneath it and then we're on. And the sail away party begins. Go. <laughs> Our cruise is 14 nights, so I'm sure time will fly and we'll be back here after a wonderful time in New Guinea. We're in an ocean view cabin on the Pacific Aria and frankly we've been really um, thrilled with the cabin. It's exceeded our expectations, hasn't it? Sure has. It's bigger than we expected it to be. We're down the bottom of the boat near the back. It's room number, stateroom number 4210 and plenty of room. The beds are very comfortable and was, as with most places it has plenty of storage and it has this comfortable couch to sit in. The storage for your clothes and things, there's, there's plenty of it. It doesn't have a fridge, which is unusual um, for a stateroom, but we've never really needed a fridge on any of the um, cruises we've been on in the past. So the bathroom, come on in. It's massive. Yeah, the bathroom's good. At Big, and, and it's got a shower. With a bath. With a bath, how about that? And of course, uh, there's plenty of to do on the ship. Every day they give you the P&O good times, and it lists all the activities that are going on on the ship. Um, today, I was quite interested in um, one of these, these things, the anti-aging party. <laughs> oh, maybe that would do me some good. But there's music going on, and there's um, endless activities going on around the ship that you can choose to do or not to do. It's over to you. The main restaurant on the area is the Waterfront. And it's an a la carte restaurant, so you have a very extensive menu, which you can do for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And they have, tend to have themes from different countries. Today I've got a slow cooked um, beef. Looks pretty good. What do you got there? This is the lamb curry. Beautifully presented. Certainly do get high quality food in the water pump. And here's the dessert. Rhubarb crumble and ice cream. Not bad, eh? A bit different on this ship is that there are specialty restaurants which are included in the fair. And this is the Dragon Lady and it's a, a Asian themed restaurant. Yeah, and it's beautiful. These are um Cheeks, these are shiitake mushrooms, and those are um, chicken kebabs. Very nice. Pretty good. Yeah, love it. 
the other specialty restaurant is Angelo's for Italian food. I think I'll have some uh, pepper, please. The smallest pepper shaker we have here. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo's. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And panna cotta for dessert. Look at that. The pantry is a different approach to a buffet for a cruise ship. It's it's more like a food court. So you got lovely curries and Chinese food. Plenty of salads, fish and chips if you want it. Beautiful roasts. And spicy Mexican, if you want it. Mexicana, yeah. And look at the lovely sweet stuff. Beautiful. You can always get fruit. Bacon and eggs for breakfast. You don't get that at home. So it actually doesn't matter where you go and what food you choose, often, this is the galley where all of our lovely food is cooked. Gym, they've got really good quality equipment, there's plenty of it. We find that we need to do at least 10,000 steps every day and get plenty of exercise because when you're eating all that food, you don't feel good unless you exercise it out. So that's one of the good things on this show, plenty of exercise. It's not as nice as biking around Kapiti, but it'll keep us fit and able to eat more <laughs> and just enjoy the boat. As usual, we take the stairs and on here now they encourage it. Once around deck six takes five minutes and it's 570 steps. Good to do some walking. So aboard the Pacific Aria, there is music happening all the time and activities happening all the time. So we thought we'd show you some of the music and some of the activities. <laughs>
Good time never seen so good, so good, so good, so good. I'm in line, ba ba ba, to believe they never would. All made out of towels. Pretty hot up here in the tropics, so good way to cool off, eh, in the pool. <laughs> the best ice cream in the world comes from New Zealand, of course. So everyone's getting glammed up in their Gatsby kind of um, attire. Now here's the ultimate Gatsby family. Look at this. For all you trivia buffs, when they ask the question, what's the second largest island in the world? New Guinea is the, is the, the goal. What has increased on women by six inches in the last uh, 50 years? Now, we've got lots of different answers up here. We've got the average dress size, we've got hair length, we've got height, we've got feet. Feet? Look at that. Woo! Uh, we've got hair, we've got uh, boobs, the breast. They actually have got bigger by size. That was a different one, actually, different survey. Uh, but uh, the correct answer is the waistline. Yes. It's time for us to sing. It's time for us to dance. It's time for us to turn around, touch the ground, jump up high, and shout. It's time for us to shine. And after all the activities on the boat, sometimes it's nice just to stand and watch. Go by. Pretty, eh? Another sunset. Look how flat the sea is, too. So it's, flat. It's been flat pretty well all the way on this trip. Yeah. It's well, we made it to New Guinea. And this is Alatau, the capital of the Milne Bay province. It's about 75,000 people. And the day's work has begun for the locals. We're in Alatau at the Cultural Centre. And in the Cultural Centre, all the different people groups come together to show their traditional dances and their traditional costumes and present their way of life. These are the Kundu drums. The waka or the canoe is very important. You can see it's made out of a big tree. And they have canoe races. So 
so each cultural group has their own costume and the way that they adorn themselves. Mostly the breasts are exposed and that is the norm. And they usually have their thighs covered. Look at the little kids. You are beautiful singers. You are beautiful singers. Tell me about the the what you are chewing, betel nut. Betel nut. Yeah. Uh, this is our uh, pique. Okay. We chew, be, chewing gum, and we our chewing gum is the betel nut. What does it taste like? It's uh, a bit bitter. Bitter. Yeah. And then we have to take uh, lime. Lime and the mustard to make it red. Okay. Okay, this is the hard one. This is the hard bituna. Okay, that's the clean one. She's still do the demonstration. Okay, she's chewing it. After that, she'll open the lime. This is the lime and this is mustard. And then she'll chew it. We'll apply mustard. We'll put mustard. To mix it with lime. Wow. Yeah. Good. It makes it red. Okay. So here yes. goes. It called our lipstick. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and does that make you more beautiful? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and makes when we don't chew and we don't chew, we feel lazy. It makes us look smart to know every little way that we want it to be done. Okay. When we we feel good when we don't now we feel lazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> then everything is done. There are over 800 tribes and therefore 800 languages in Papua New Guinea and it's wonderful when they all get together and celebrate like this. Most of the time they're celebrating Every now and then, of course, there's war, and that's why we saw the warriors doing their thing as well. It's wonderful to be here. This is a memorial for the Battle of Milne Bay that took place here in 1942. After the Japanese um, attack on Pearl Harbor, they started working their way down through the Pacific, and the Australian forces came up and tried to repel them as they worked their way through Papua New Guinea. There was a big battle here which the Australians finally uh, triumphed and pushed the Japanese back. This is the harbour at Alatau. Obviously fishing is very important. And suddenly there's a downpour and we all head off under the burrows have a look at all the woodwork, it's just beautiful here. Yeah. Well, it's it, yeah. Cool. And here's the Alatau town centre, the bus station, supermarket, and the town. And this is the main business centre. So Alatau is not really very big. It's actually quite pleasant. It's not too cold. It's not cold at all, actually. But we may get wet on the way back. Well, we've had an absolutely fabulous day here in uh, Alatau on our first day in Papua New Guinea. I just loved seeing the culture and interacting with the local people. It's just been wonderful. Now, let's say this way. This is Papua New Guinea. Why don't you choose our country and come and visit us? Yeah, it's wonderful, eh? <laughs> and thank you thank for having you us. Visiting. Thank you for visiting Papua New Guinea and especially Alatau. Yes. Melin Bay. <laughs>Over there is Madang, capital of the Madang province, which has over 400,000 people, set against the Bismarck Ranges over there. It was occupied by Germany, then taken by the British in the Second World War. Over there is an Australian Navy ship, and it's there because there have been reports of an outbreak of anthrax in Madang.
Papua New Guinea lies on the ring of fire around the edge of the Pacific, so there's lots of volcanoes. And this is one of them, Manam Island. To make up for us not going into uh, Madang today, we're going on a uh, sail-by of various volcanic islands. This is Bam Island, the most active volcano in Papua New Guinea, and it's got two peaks, but unfortunately they're covered by cloud today. And over there's Kedavar, which uh, had a major eruption just a couple of weeks ago. Hope it doesn't go up tonight. Now welcome to Wewak, which is the capital of the East Sepik province. And the Sepik is the major river that services right up into the highlands and um, where most of the trade comes from. So this is a very important town. There's about 90 different languages and tribes in this region and over 400,000 people. During World War II, the Japanese had an air base here at Wewak, and so it became a fairly strategic place to be, and the Allies bombed this place um, a number of times during the World War II period. <laughs> Lots of people here at the port welcoming people from Pacific area. This is the main road and the local bus and the main market. So many people out on the streets and just wandering around. Everybody's just doing what they do every day. Just amazing. So different to back home, eh? <laughs> yeah, big long queues for the bank. They put them in one at a time. You feel safe though, in the middle of the street. Just so many people out and about. And everywhere there's the spitting from the betel nut. Everyone spits there. There's our ship over there. It's a big thing when the ship comes in. So all the locals come out. We're on the top of Mission Hill and this is a memorial for both the Japanese and the Australians who fought here. Uh, during the Second World War. Nice views too, eh? Nice how all the countries that were involved are commemorated here, eh? Nowadays this is part of the Catholic mission, so everything's a lot more peaceful, not like those horrible days in the war. And these are some old Japanese guns. There's lots of pretty ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fighting deep in the jungle. Leftovers of the war everywhere in the jungle. And this is all that's left. And this place here was where the Japanese finally surrendered to the Australian forces. This is St Mary's Catholic Primary School. So they're pretty good facilities for the children. Do you like school? Yes. You do? <laughs> do you sing like that? Yeah. Lovely. Thank you for having us at your school. Bye bye. This is a traditional market where they sell the villum, the lovely bags that they put over the shoulder. Kids are gorgeous, aren't they? And how long does it take to make one? Oh, you just continue to make it. 
In one week, you can complete it. One week? Mm. Okay. Yeah. For carrying big ones, we carry it. Like food, food, greens. Go to store, you can store. Small ones, we just put up twice or that has. <laughs> put your betel nuts in there. <laughs> Mustard and bitter nut, and this is lime. This is lime. Three things. When we do these three things, it makes red, red in color. It, is it good for your teeth? It makes our teeth grow strong. Ah, oh, good. When we don't eat bitter nut, our teeth started to lose. Okay. We had a great time and we're back and amongst the chaos there is order. People are friendly and they're polite. And as it says on one of the t-shirts of one of the local boys from their school. We, we all, all smile, smile in, in the, the same, same language. language. <laughs> Now we're in the Wetu Islands, which are some volcanic islands in the Bismarck Sea. And we're going to do something a little bit different. This particular island is Garove, and it's a volcanic caldera. And you might just be able to see there that the side of the caldera has fallen in and the sea goes into the middle of the island. So we are going to sail into the middle of a volcano. It's about a kilometer across and the water depth is 135 meters. Over there's an old Roman Catholic mission. And the inside of the caldera. It's amazing to think that all of this was caused by a massive volcanic eruption long, long time ago. See if there's an echo. This is very special. Never done anything like this before. It's great. Next stop is Rabaul. And now welcome to Rabaul. This is a town with a very, very sad past. It's set right under a number of volcanoes and it was completely destroyed in 1937 with a volcanic eruption, occupied by the Japanese, and then flattened again, completely destroyed by the Allies when they were bombing the place, and then again in 1994 was destroyed by a volcano but it's been rebuilt and now it's a thriving little town. Yes, the current placement of this um, Rabul is different to the original because it was covered in ash in the 1994 eruption. The Japanese constructed lots and lots of tunnels and they reckon 500 kilometers of tunnels and they used uh, local labor to do it. These ones were constructed here because the sea is so deep just here and the submarines could come in. Yes, the sea's actually drops to 300 meters suddenly and that's why they could bring the submarines in close. And then store all their stuff in the tunnels. Good thing that the Japanese weren't too tall. <laughs> Pretty amazing feat to, to create 500 kilometers of these tunnels. Some of them, they had hospitals. They kept all their stores there, all their munitions, keeping them safe. It's actually quite cool in there, which, is, which will be great for keeping some of their supplies. But mostly they're not short you could stand up straight which is quite a feat they've really done an amazing job in there incredible that such a lovely spot should be the center of warfare and so many awful things have taken place 
in the 1400s there was a giant eruption and it formed this great big caldera which then filled up with the sea. Over there is Mount Tavurvo and then over there is Mount Vulcan and they're the ones that erupted in 1937 and again in 1994. Covered the whole of Rabaul here with ash destroying the town but they've rebuilt it. Isn't that a beautiful sight today? But I suppose they're always under threat of having another volcanic eruption. And they're continually monitoring all of the volcanoes. This used to be the main street of Rabaul. It was lined with shops and houses and hotels and restaurants. And now it's just covered in volcanic ash. And this is General Yamamoto's bunker where he directed operations for the Japanese. Right next door to the Papua New Guinea Club. Here's the maps that he used to document what was going on. And there's maps, maps on the roof as well. This is the site of the Japanese airport, so there were thousands of fighter planes lined up out here and now, just look at it. Over here is where people used to live, houses, shops, and all under the volcano. It's a bit like a desert really. We're on um, volcanic ash, edge of the caldera around there and Mount Tavuavu. See the bubbling there? It's hot. Amazing to think that this came out of there only in 1994. Buona kaka. Buona kake. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, that's got it. This is the local market where everybody sells everything. Goes six days a week. There's the lime to go with the betel nut. There's a big bean. Giant bean. Jack and the Beanstalk, yeah. things to buy, although there's an awful lot of beetle nuts. <laughs> I think it's the favourite. Well we've had a really wonderful day here in Rabaul and it's been wonderful to see how a town can literally rise up out of the ashes. Now welcome to Kurawina, which is the biggest island in the Trobriand Island group and they have a very original way of life here so it's going to be very very interesting and it's such a beautiful place as well. Well hello this is uh, Papa here, cruise director on the beautiful Pacific Aria and uh, as you can see we're on a beautiful island today of Kirawina. It's been an absolutely amazing cruise, we're so happy to have everyone here. It looks like everyone's having a great time as well. I think it's been a wonderful cruise. As you can see the sun is out the locals are right and everyone's having a great time eating far too much crayfish and lobsters as well. Kirawina is a matrilineal society. It means that the women hold the highest status actually. But it's a very beautiful place to be. They have lots of these caves which are nice for keeping cool and uh, possibly for burial sites too. And they make very very beautiful crafts. Lovely woodwork, lovely people. Kirawina has a population of about 12,000 people and it's a big thing when the tourist ship comes in because it's a very rare occasion. The favourite English word of the children particularly is hello. Everywhere you go they say hello. Hello. The houses are very primitive, made of um, just materials that they can get out of the bush, leaves and the like. 
Very happy people though. Here's the oven for cooking food over hot ashes. And you may notice the markings on the face of the women is the same markings as the first place we went to, Alatal. So it's very likely that these people from this place came over to Alatal to entertain us for the, the sing sing at the beginning of our cruise. And do you play the cricket? Yes. How long does a game go for? Uh, it's 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Yeah. And are you good at batting or bowling or what? No, we are hitting the ball. Just hitting the ball? Yes. Oh, very good. Thank you for having us in your island. Thank you. Very we much. love it. So Ross is snorkeling out there, trying to see what fish there is to see here. So how is that? Oh, it's lovely for swimming, useless for snorkeling. Oh, I wondered about that. It looked a bit rough. I saw one fish in the total, that's all. <laughs> Next island, I think. Yeah, okay. So isn't the Kirawina Islands just such a lovely place? Next stop is Katava in the Trebriand Islands group. This has only got about 3,000 people. And um, they reckon that the way that the people live there is unchanged over the last thousand years. is interesting look at that lots of fish here what's the snorkeling like nice colors eh yeah, colors, purples and yellows in the coral the lifestyle on Catawba is very simple. To make their houses, they just get stuff out of the bush. Very simple. And their diet is incredibly healthy. They reckon it's the most healthy in the world. They've got root vegetables, fruit, they've got fish, they've got coconuts, everything they need. It just makes you think about the kind of lifestyle that we have with all of its technology and complexity. They have everything that they need right here on the side <laughs> We feel so privileged to come here to Katawa. The people here are just so lovely and what a gorgeous, gorgeous tropical island. Now for something special for our last stop in Papua New Guinea. We're in the Conflict Islands, named after a ship built in Sydney in HMS Conflict in the 1880s. And this is a privately owned island. Nobody lives here. And it's built on a reef. Um, and there's a gap in the reef that's big enough to allow a ship through. So P&O have negotiated with the owner to come in here occasionally. So today we're going on an isolated, beautiful, tropical island and it's just us. And I suppose there'll be 1,263 others because nobody will be on the ship. We're anchored in an atoll here inside the reef. They have a welcome centre here and we're going to start by going from the welcome centre right round the island on the on the walk. Leisurely stroll around this lovely park. Beautiful place, isn't it? Sure is. 
There's a wee airstrip, football field. Not too many airstrips have a, uh, a footy field on the end of it. The track around the island is really beautifully formed, going through the lovely jungle. And all the way around the island is the beautiful white beach and the beautiful blue sea. Wonderful, isn't it? And here's the main snorkeling beach, so we're going to have a go at doing some snorkeling. Nemo! <laughs> Nemo was down there looking very, very good. Well, visiting the Conflict Islands has been a really lovely way of finishing our tour of New Guinea. What a lovely place. And it's starting to rain. <laughs> Let's but go. Never mind. Now we've got just two more days at sea and then we're back in Brisbane. A bit more choppy on our way back to Brisbane. Boat going up and down a bit. Well, our cruise on the Pacific Aria is now over and we've made it back to Brisbane. What a wonderful, wonderful cruise it has been. We've been on lots of cruises around the world and I reckon that this particular one on the Pacific Aria, going to Papua New Guinea, it's been right up there with our very best of cruises that we've done. We've just loved the ship and all of its activities, but it was Papua New Guinea that um, made the difference. The people there, the sights there, the culture, the difference of their, of their culture and the primitiveness of their culture and the beauty of those tropical islands, it all came together to make just a fantastic holiday. I, I'd really recommend this, this particular cruise. I've loved every minute of it. Fantastic. Well, two weeks and to sum it up, one word. Wow, it's been fantastic. The, the ship was such a surprise for us. The food, the entertainment, the um, activities, the comfortable room, everything was just wonderful. We really enjoy the Pacific area. And then there's the offshore excursions and Papua New Guinea was new to us and to go and explore the beautiful places and to see the people in their own culture doing their daily activity was just amazing. So this is a, up there with one of the best we've ever done. Thank you P&O, fantastic holiday.